You're listening to Artistic Finance, show 78. On today's show, we discuss ethical investing in the stock market. Investopedia reports that the top 100 socially responsible ETFs hold $30 billion in assets. A high proportion of those holdings are with millennial investors. My guest is lighting director, programmer, and the design rep for Ayrton Lighting, Chris Lose. Chris explains why he invests ethically and how he does. He provides the resources he uses in case you want to lean into his method. And we discuss how taking small actions can gain momentum. Specifically with charity, small amounts of money in the right place can create a big impact. During the conversation, Chris mentions he started getting his investments in shape at age 28. The earlier you start investing, the better. If you haven't heard it, I recommend listening to episode 53 on compound interest, which was with Planet Money's Patty Hirsch. Search for it on the episodes page of artisticfinance.com or find it in the show notes, along with links to everything we discussed today. Without further ado, let's get to the show. You're listening to Artistic Finance Podcast, where your host, Ethan Steimel, interviews successful artists, leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire artists to grow their wealth. We are recording this November 30th, 2021. The new strain of COVID-19 Omicron has caused indoor mask mandates back into effect in New York City. Broadway is still open requiring all guests to provide proof of vaccine and wear masks while inside the theater. And the holiday season is in full force, which reminds me to remind you that while you're roaming around purchasing worldly goods for others, be sure to spend a bit on yourself, specifically in a Roth IRA and specifically putting those IRA funds into an index fund, a low cost index fund at that. So for example, perhaps the S&P 500, ticker IVV, or if you're into cryptocurrency, maybe the VanEck Digital Transformation ETF, ticker DAPP, or for today, an ethically responsible ESG fund, such as the iShares MSCI ESG ETF, which is ticker SUSA. And at 0.25% of an expense ratio, There are other lower fee indexes out there, but they aren't as ESG focused. And just so you know, the MSCI part of the title in that company is a rating for ESG standards. Um, And then full disclosure, I do own some S&P 500, the IVV ticker. So if you've listened to our 6K episodes, you already know that. The other funds I do not own, nor do I plan to, and I'm not recommending any of these, but I'm just letting you know that they exist and to think about you and your retirement. So that all being said, a little bit of a long intro here. (laughs) Welcome and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Ethan Steimel, and today I welcome Chris Lose to the show. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. I uh, enjoy having this discussion already. (laughs) So thank you for being here, and for people who might not know you, can you tell us a bit about yourself? So I am a an industry veteran. I've been in the industry for over 20 years. Uh, I have done many world tours with uh, many artists, including Fleetwood Mac, Don Henley, Nicki Minaj, Pearl Jam, Elton John. I lived in Vegas for several years, did a couple of house jobs. I worked for Cirque du Soleil. And uh, most recently, I am the designer relations developer uh, out of Paris. And I am also a writer for PLSN, uh, LD at Large, which is the back page of the magazine. It's an opinion article that I get to write every month, just kind of have a voice in the industry. And I am doing my very best to make sure I have some money for when all of this falls through someday again. Oh, fantastic. Music to my ears. More to cover, but uh, that's uh, that's the summary of Chris Lowe's. All right. I, I love it. And now some icebreaker questions that I ask everybody. So first off, can you describe your demographics for us? All right. So I am uh, the painfully vanilla type. I am the white, cis, normative, male I would say I'm upper middle class upbringing and from Northern California. The only minority that I fall into would be uh, a vegan. 
Uh, other than that, I am the predominant colonialized, uh, colonizer, uh, oppressor, you name it. I'm, I'm all of them. I fit every single demographic. Well, with, with vegan, I mean, that's gaining traction. So give it 20 years and that might also not be a minority anymore. <laughs> See, I'm, all, I'm, I'm even colonizing the, the minorities. I'm, I'm taking them mainstream. <laughs> um, and can I also ask, obviously don't answer anything you don't want to. But your relationship status and your education? Bachelor of Arts from University of Nevada, Las Vegas. My schooling has always been theater. I am painfully underqualified to do anything except lighting. Come the zombie apocalypse, if anybody needs anything other than high-end lighting equipment, I'm not very useful. I, I don't know how to fix many things. I don't know how to do a lot of stuff. But my education is all theater. I am married. I've been married for 15 years and I have two kids. They are nine-year-old twins named Tiger and Lily, and they are both in school up here in Canada. Tiger being the real name. Uh, Tiger and Lily are their middle names. Uh, his name is Zachary Tiger. My daughter's name is Isabel Lily. Okay. Well, I love those names. Isabella Lily. That's like classy and, and fantastic. Okay. So your geographic background, you said Las Vegas. Originally from Northern California, moved to Reno thinking it would be like Las Vegas. It wasn't. <laughs> Reno is not like Las Vegas. Yes, they both have gambling. They are not the same. They are not the same city. They're in the same state. They are worlds apart. Uh, eventually, I ended up moving to Las Vegas, where I was there for the last approximately twenty years. My wife and I were perfectly happy in Las Vegas. We could have lived there. I could still be living there today. But, uh, as soon as it came time for my kids to be in the education system. My wife and I decided that the American education system, especially Nevada, which is a very transient town, was not where we wanted our kids to get an education. So we moved to Canada. There were several other reasons, but that is the probably the main reason that we left in 2017 and moved to Windsor, Ontario. It's the southernmost point of Canada. Um, okay. So now your creative and financial personalities, what is a live event that you like to experience or a piece of art that you like? So the one that probably impacted me the most recently, and I'll preface this, I'm a huge live events fan. I feel like I got into this industry just so that I could have the best seat in the house at the concerts that I like. I do my very best to work for the bands that I respect. For pre-COVID, I used to be able to tell you every two or three weeks of about a concert I had gone to, but now it's really tough to look back the most recent live event that I attended because I wanted to. Well, okay, let's just say you have Tomorrow Free and somebody came up and said, every single band you've ever heard of is playing tomorrow and I'm going to give you tickets to whichever one you want to go to. Who would you go see? Linkin Park? No, no way. That can't be true. That's the last one that I really was excited about going to see. But I mean, that, I mean, Chester's been dead for several years. I have a dream of a Bob Marley hologram show. I would go to that in a heartbeat. If they, I, I don't care if it was like just animatronics with like uh, a VR thing that I had to put over my head to watch and like and, and enjoy the digital representation of Bob Marley. But I would absolutely go to a Bob Marley concert if if technology could provide that for me. I would I would do that. All right, any producers listening, you at least have one ticket sold to this virtual <laughs> Bob Marley show. <laughs> <laughs> and I would go with Chris. So you have two you have two tickets sold. <laughs> I mean, my wife and I, Abba is doing a hologram tour uh, next year. And we're like, oh, I guess we need to go to Sweden or Europe to see it because we, we want to see that. They're all still alive, though, and they're still doing a, an AR tour. They're still alive. But I think Nicole was like, oh, well, it's not them. And I was like, and I think they might actually be singing. I think they might be singing, but the holograms will be on stage. Okay. Don't quote me on that. I need to look it up again. Um, but at first, Nicole was like, ah, I don't want to see that. But I was like, I absolutely would see that. And plus, who are we all in love with? We're in love with the ABBA. We all know that like two years that they were super popular and all the music videos were made. Right. That's what we love. So like seeing that with a bunch of other people that also want to see it, I'm, I'm down with I'm that. I'm with you on that one. If I went to see ABBA right now and they like tried to play some new songs that I didn't know, I, I wouldn't get it. I, mean, I, had, I didn't come to hear new songs. No <laughs> new songs. Okay. Your financial personality. Are you good or bad with money? I am proud to say that my wife and I both went on a journey. We were both terrible. We were really bad and we got better and we are still to this day progressing. I would say on the spectrum, I've gone from negative 10 
to like a five out of 10. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. That's a 15 point difference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or star rating. Yeah. Uh, how old are you? I am 43. You're 43. You've been married for 15 years and you guys got better together. Yes. 33, 28. So starting at age 28, you guys progressively got better with your finances. Yes. About the time we had kids, we kind of realized, oh boy, we have to make some changes. Okay. And I'm just pointing all that out because I think a lot of people, as soon as they get out of schooling, they think like, oh, I need to be whatever. And they get to age 30 and they're like, ah, panic. I got to jump into gear, which is all true. But it's not too late. It's never too late. Never, never too late. Unless you're 60 plus and then just give up, guys. Stop <laughs> listening to this. <laughs> just kidding. We've had 60 plus people on here and they're doing great. Okay, so we met in Las Vegas, you and I, at LDI. Yes. Uh, Artistic Finance did a live episode there. You sort of watched the first half of it, which, by the way, thank you for attending it. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. I, I, I took a lot from it. And then also, can you tell the story of how you and I met? Because this, this relates back to our episode 74, which was about LinkedIn. So I am a, an avid user of LinkedIn. Every time I am looking for somebody or something, I usually check LinkedIn first. If I can't find it, then I'll go to Instagram or Facebook and then the rest of the internet. I have found so many contacts through LinkedIn. And sometimes it's even something that somebody put there one time before because they thought they had to and then let it go and they've forgotten that it's there. But it's just enough of a crack of a window to be able to get some amount of information on who's working on what or who knows who. So I, I use LinkedIn quite a bit. Yours popped up when I was looking through Don Shang. Well, I can tell I can tell you how it worked from my end. Okay. So you posted a photo of the Ayrton setup at LDI. And and you said something like, here's our booth. <laughs> and so I commented because I was taking a class at the time in which I had to make four comments a day. And I commented, having seen the booth, and I said, it looks even better in person. Aha. To which you then replied or something, and then we connected. And then you said, hey, you're doing a presentation tomorrow. Or I said I was doing a presentation. And I said, it's right next to your booth, which is why I saw the booth. And you said, come see me. Long story short, I didn't go see you because I'm really bad at networking. <laughs> But the next day you reached out and you said, hey, come out for drinks or come for dinner. And so we eventually did meet up. That's the digital age now. Like I've never met you before. You'd never met me before. We just happened to be close. It was we really closed the six degrees of separation in a matter of minutes. But it's just going back to that episode on LinkedIn where Don was saying, Ethan, you need to make a LinkedIn. I eventually got around to it. And now we're having this episode today because of LinkedIn. Like if I didn't j jump on LinkedIn, none of this would have happened. Yeah, I would have missed the whole speech. I would have missed everything. Okay, so then the other reason we're talking today is because I did go to dinner with you and I just noticed that you weren't eating meat. I said, oh, are you vegan? You said yes. And then that segued somehow into your investing philosophy. A and I'm not saying that vegans are the most ethical people in the world, but to me, that's a sign that, oh, this person is thinking about what they're doing. They're being intentional about the planet. And it may be for their own health, and it may be for the planet, but either way, they're making decisions. Yes. My first question for you is, what is your relationship with investing? And I assume that ties into that lifestyle. So I guess let's start, let's start there. So I had several Roth IRAs and 401ks from past companies. And then when I had kids, we, we kind of rolled them all over into what I believed to be the best idea for a college fund was with just a savings account. I didn't trust the market. I didn't understand the market. I thought coming from the 2008 thing, you can just put money in investment and it can just disappear one day and you have no sort of recourse. So I was scared. I didn't like the idea at all. But then after several years, the only money that was in there was money that I put in. Luckily, that money never went down but it wasn't going up very fast either. We would get a thing at the end of the year, like, oh, congratulations, you made 12 cents on your savings account. So, so can I ask, what, there's something called the 529 College Savings Plan, which is a, a tax-sheltered way to save for your, your kid's education. So you're saying you didn't have one of those, you just had a savings account that you had dedicated to be the college fund or the education fund. Yep, no 529 my wife and I have looked into 529s. We're not down because I don't know which country my kids are going to go to school in. Basically, if you do the 529, you're not limited to the school or the state, but you are limited to the country. 
I'm not convinced my children are going to go to school in the United States or Canada, or, you know, they might go to Germany for school. You'd, you'd have to do like a, a study abroad through a school in that country. Right. Can be limiting. Okay. So, so sorry to go back to that savings plan. So it was an actual savings plan, not a brokerage account. So you couldn't invest that money. It was just sitting there in the savings account. Just sitting in a savings account. It, I may as well have just been putting it under my mattress. Which is, don't get me wrong, that worked for many people before. And, and the important thing there is that just like being a vegan, you're making a choice. So you are saving, yeah. but you're not investing. S saving, making that choice is better than doing nothing. So even though it may not have been invested, it may not have been growing, and we're all bummed about that, it still was being set aside. So it was more than zero, yes. which is always a great, great way to be. Yes. Okay. So uh, my wife and I both got disappointed that it's not growing. And this was post the 2008 crash. So we kind of realized that, okay, now it's going to be a while for that to happen again. Let's, let's invest this money. And we did not want to invest in anything that involved oil or coal. You know, there's so many of these banks that when we put our money in the banks, they, they use our money to destroy the planet, to extract resources they're not helping. If anything, I've learned in the last few years that our vote, our vote is powerful. Everybody should vote. Absolutely. But it's not nearly as powerful as where you put your money. Uh, if anything in the United States, North America in general, probably the entire world, wherever you put your money is what you're voting on. So we decided that if we're going to put our money somewhere, it has to go towards making the world better. And my wife and I are both meliorists in the fact that we we think that people can make the world better. The time I noticed it the most was when a buddy of mine who went to protest at the Black Rock Protect the Water from the pipeline, he used his, his Wells Fargo account to pay for all of his stuff to go to the protest. I'm like, dude, your money is in Wells Fargo. They're the biggest funder of the Black Rock thing. He's like, oh, yeah, well, that's dumb. Like, it is dumb. You got to pay attention to like where your, your money is. You have to be in relationship with your money. My wife and I looked for uh, ethical investing, and it, it is a growing market. There are a lot of people that are starting to put two and two together. We talked to a lot of people, and there was a lot of greenwashing going on. There's a lot of people going like, yeah, yeah, give us your money. It's impact investing, and it was really just a buzzword for them. They're like, yeah, yeah, look at this. Um, we have impact investing. Okay, and my wife was who's pays attention to every detail. She's like, okay, can I see some of the companies that are in that in that stock? And she's like, no. No, you can't. And my wife was not having it. She's like, that's not being in relationship with That's just giving to my money who's somebody who's telling me what I want to hear. So we had to look and look and look. And finally, we found Claire at Beyond Investing. And it, it is linked to Beyond Meat, but it is the idea is it is beyond investing. And it is investing in the beyond, investing in the futures. Uh, it's investing in everything that comes on a vegan scale. And when I say vegan scale, I don't just mean not eating meat. I mean, sustainability. I mean, gender diversity. Everybody that Beyond Investing invests in is held to a certain amount of standard that basically implies environmental responsibility. So I reached out to Claire. Beyond Investing is more for the brokers. It wasn't for me. So she handed me off to a broker. And my broker's name is JC Corsentino. She's out of, she's out of Florida. She is... If she's listening, she is like the saint of the investing world to me. She is a vegan out in the South who runs a sanctuary, is a Boy Scout troop leader, supports eco-friendly burials. Basically, she left LA to become an impact investor and bring more people on board. When we talked to her, it was clear that she was not greenwashing. She can tell us where all of our money is. I can text her almost any time, day or night. And she's always willing to have a conversation. She's been very upfront with us and she can tell us like, hey, so we're putting money in Tesla, which isn't, you know, quote unquote, a vegan company, but they are trying to help. They're trying to make things better. Nothing's ever going to make it hundred percent on the vegan scale. We're all clearly not in a vegan world these days. So. Well, I love how this is all intertwined because just from my knowledge of eco-friendly burials, if somebody is knowledgeable about that, that already is telling you something. Because there's only like 10 things you can do with your body when you die. Yeah. Three of them are eco-friendly and the rest are not to various degrees. So already you know that some sort of values are aligning if somebody knows about the three <laughs> eco-friendly yeah. ways of burial. <laughs> That's a whole other rabbit hole we could go down. But uh, the way we bury people nowadays is terrible. 
All of them are terrible. That was my takeaway from watching Ozark. I don't want to give any spoilers away, but I was thinking, this isn't the eco-friendliest way to bury people here. (laughs) 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 So I love that you found Claire and then JC. Is JC your broker for just your children's education fund or is this for all of your investments? I will be totally upfront. We took all of our money, everything that we had in the world and we gave it to JC. Okay. So she says, this is the education one. This is you for your retirement. And this is just your brokerage. Yeah. She maintains my IRAs, my Roth IRAs, my stocks, my bonds, my everything that I have available in the future. Index funds, if, if you look into, you know, what's a good way to just grow your wealth without thinking about it, without focusing on it and low cost, it's uh, index funds. S&P 500, for example, there's oil and gas companies in there. They're just picking the largest companies, not caring about ethical behavior. With your brokerage account with JC, is it all individual picks or are there some index funds? Are there some things that may not be fully ethical, but it's, it's probably the reliable thing to do? I don't believe so. I don't. I believe that is why we went to JC. Uh, I would have to go through and I look. I don't understand all the the four letter codes, but uh, I I have to kind of rely on JC. And in fact, I should I should take one second to say like I am not a financial advisor in any way. I, I th- I've heard you make that disclaimer several times before. I'm a lighting guy who just knows enough about this stuff to be dangerous. Hopefully I'm going to have some amount of money when my knees give out and I I can't be on the road anymore. There's an amount of trust and faith that I just have to have in JC to make sure that my money is going to the places I I want it to. It's, It's so ethereal to me. I don't know. I gave a bunch of money to somebody else who I'd never met. I mean, I've met her on Zoom but I just sent her all my money. And all I know about where my money is, is what's happening on my app. When did you go to JC? Well, first of all, how long have you been vegan? (laughs) And is your wife and kids, are they vegan? So how long have you been vegan? And then at what point did you get into the ethical investing? Uh, This happened about six years ago. Uh, My father was diagnosed with two different types of colorectal cancer. He survived both of them. He's, he's doing quite well. He's a very strong human being. He's going to be around for a long time. I'm his son, so I had to Google it and see if I, I'm at risk for any of these things. Colorectal cancer is not hereditary in the fact that it's genetic, but it is hereditary in your lifestyle choices and your dietary choices. The leading cause of colorectal cancer is excessive meat consumption. That makes perfect sense in my family. My family Meat is like our philanthropy, everything that we're doing. If my dad is going to go to a fundraiser, he's going to get some animals from the local 4-H. He's going to cook them up and he's going to sell them off and he's going to he's going to make everybody happy and we're going to do a great job. So it was part of my identity for many years. As soon as I discovered I'm at, at high risk for this, I gave up meat, almost cold turkey. Like I just gave it up. And I told my wife, like, hey, I'm, I want to cut out meat. And my wife was fully on board with that. So then after five years of convincing my children that they needed to eat meat for protein, uh, we had a dog. Her name was Kala. She lived to be about 13 years old. And she developed bone cancer at the end of her 13 years. And we had to put her down. And my son, who is very talkative, if it enters his brain, it's going to come out of his mouth. And he looks at me, he's like, well, dad, are we going to eat Kala? I'm like, no we don't, we don't eat, we don't eat dogs. He's like, well, we eat all the other animals. Why are we going to barbecue Kala? I'm like, I, because we care about Kala. And he's like, well, don't we care about the other animals? I'm like, oh man, that was a very big question coming from a five-year-old. And I, and I couldn't answer him with any, with any sort of consistency. The best I could come up with was because now eat your chicken, <laughs> you know? I had to research that topic. I'm like, well, why do we do that? Why do, why do some cultures eat dogs? Why do some not? And I, I started reading a bunch of philosophy on the subject, peer-reviewed studies, and there's really no reason to be hurting the other animals anymore. In evolutionary times, there was the winter and we didn't have supermarkets and we didn't have anything available. So we had to start killing the other animals and eating them. We've kind of progressed past that. And then now we've basically become addicted to it. We, we eat so much meat. We're not just getting the animals from nature anymore. We're confining them. We're artificially inseminating them. 
for kidnapping their children. We're, it's really not working out for us. The CAFO, the confined farming system is, is really terrible for the environment. It's terrible for the animals. It's terrible for our diets, pumping them full of antibiotics, it's not helping anybody, especially the animals. That all happened about six years ago. The more I learn about it, the more I realize there's so many reasons to stop hurting the other animals. It's, it's just outdated, like VHS or Kodachrome. There, there's no reason for it anymore. There's no nutrients that we can't get from plants. There's no, uh, there's no products that we can use for decoration that we, we have to get from, from animals. We just have better technology now. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if in our lifetime, cultured meat replaces half of the market, at least. I don't know if it's ever going to replace the entire animal exploitation industry, but we're going to see lots of advancements in that. Yeah, I think eventually. Because I mean, I always throw out India anytime anybody's saying we need meat for protein, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, check how many people eat meat in India. And if a billion people can eat no meat, I think we can all be fine. <laughs> uh, our Western culture is even seeping over there too. We're, they're, they're, even their meat consumption is on the rise. And I'm happy for people to eat meat or not eat meat. That's up to them. All this to ethical. So wait, just to make sure this episode is at least some semi-informative, <laughs> I went to NerdWallet and I got their definition of ethical investing. Ethical investing is a strategy where an investor chooses investments based on a personal ethical code. Ethical investing strives to support industries making a positive impact, such as sustainable energy, and create an investing return. With an increase of ESG funds, there are more ethical investments than ever. They threw in that buzzword of yours, positive impact or impact investing. But what it boils down to is everybody has their own ethical code. We've talked a lot about vegan and sustainability for the planet. There are other ways if other people, it just depends on their own ethics. I will go out on a limb though, though is to say that the vegan ethical code is, is no more complicated than the golden rule. It's basically don't impose your will on anybody that you don't, that you wouldn't want for yourself. So basically, if you don't want to hurt other people or others, then don't. If you don't want to be exploited, don't exploit others. And also, we're going to get to ESG in a minute, what, what that means. But I'm curious, you mentioned Tesla. Are there any other sort of stocks or anything like that that sort of stick out in your mind as ethical companies you're invested in? Like, no, no recommendations. Don't, I'm not telling anybody what to do. We stick to the, on the stock market, it's V-E-G-N. It's the vegan... It's the vegan index. And basically anything that goes into there is above a six on the vegan scale. And that's the one I keep my eye on the most. I like seeing, I like seeing that one grow. If nothing else, I, if anybody's listening still, I want them to know that there is money to be made in replacing outdated technology. And that's what veganism is right now. There are so many emerging technologies. Uh, the best example that I can come up with is when we replaced the horse-drawn carriage with cars. People thought, well, you can never replace the horse-drawn carriage. It's been part of our history for thousands of years. You can't replace that with some sort of technology. A lot of people were afraid to invest in cars until Henry Ford said, watch me do it. And anybody who was invested in horse-drawn carriages at the time is, was probably kicking themselves in the butt saying, man, I thought horse-drawn carriages were going to be around forever. And now here we are, you know, a hundred, 200 years later, nobody uses horse-drawn carriages anymore. And also those horse-drawn carriage, a lot of them pivoted to then producing cars. Yeah. They're like, Hey, we know how to make wheels. Can we start making wheels for the, for the new confounded automobiles that you're talking about, Mr. Ford? Like, yeah, you can make wheels, get on the assembly line. All right. Okay. Oh, the, oh, the v sorry. I wanted to ask about this vegan rating. So you said it's anything that's a six. What, what are, what are the numbers on the vegan rating and where can I find that? That is a very good question. I don't know the answer to that one. I would have to reach out to JC for that one. But I know that uh, it comes down to gender diversity, fossil fuel free investments, corporate transparency, green bonds, and environmental awareness are probably the biggest factors that are on that scale. Anybody who's trying to hide anything from JC, she's like, nah, you guys are hiding something and we don't invest in them. And I do think that was a good point you made that nothing's perfect. If you make a product, you have to ship it somewhere. Well, shipping technically is not green. Every company has to ship things. One of the things that really drew me to this one 
is that before my wife and I started investing, I had taken an effective altruism pledge, which basically means I have pledged to donate at least 10% of my income to effective charities. Uh, that was uh, coming from Peter Singer. It's, uh, it's the way that we can make the world better as upper middle class, as a privileged class of people that if we all took 10% of what we make and donate them to the best causes. So we were doing that and it's, it's very useful, but it, it's, it also feels like you're just giving that money away and you don't know where it goes. Uh, I use effective altruism rating charts to try and donate to the best charities. When you're donating, you're just losing that money to yourself. When you're investing that money, you're going to see a return on investment and you're feeling good about where your money is going. And the reason I was drawn to that is because even if I lost all that money, I would be very sad. I would be devastated. Don't get me wrong. The one little straw that I could grasp onto is that that went to companies that were trying to make the world a better place. I hope to return all that money. But at the same time, I, if I lost all of that, I would tell myself a story that's saying, well, we tried. We tried to make things better as opposed to some mega conglomerate coal company just taking all my money and laughing at me. I wouldn't like to tell myself that story. I, I love that. I also love that pledge because when you take a pledge like that, when you make a, a choice, a choice like that snowballs into something bigger because when you make the choice, okay, that's nothing. That's just a mental shift. But then one year into doing that choice, I mean, 10% of your income, regardless of your income level, is more than zero. And then year two, that's double what you did. Because there's the story of Bill Gates, who's the number one philanthropist in the world. The way he got into that was he, don't quote me on any of this, but he gave like $10,000 to some cancer society. And it was like a famous one, like the American Cancer Society or something. And they wrote him a letter and they said, hey, you are the single largest donor to cancer research in the world ever. And he said, I just gave him $10,000 and I'm the highest donator out of all companies, all people. What little amount can create such a huge impact? And so that's how he started by just by doing a little bit and then realizing, oh, intentionally putting it small amounts places can cause massive in impact. So I love that about your story because you're no Bill Gates as far as I know, but it's the same idea of we're going to make this place better. Do you know what I that, that is a great story. I will have to give you my Chris Lose scaled version of that one. I recently di donated to Animal Liberation Uganda. The reason I found them is because I get criticized all the time as a vegan for like, oh, you're such a privileged class of people trying to tell people what to do. I'm like, no, veganism is not a upper white class middle thing. It's vegans exist all over the world in all economic classes. There are vegans in India, there's vegans in Uganda, there's vegans in Nigeria. So I found Animal Liberation Uganda, they're an animal activist in Uganda, and I sent them $200. And they emailed me back saying, we are going to open up the West Wing, we're going to buy new property, build a whole new barn in your name. Thank you so much for that amount of money. And I'm like, whoa, it's absolutely true. It's $200 to me. If I were to donate $200, to the Salvation Army, that would be like a couple of video games for some kids that probably already have a gaming system and probably already have a house or something. You know, I'm sure they need more help. I would love to help them out. But $200 in Uganda goes so much farther. And I, I use a website called kiva.org. It's, it's not a charity, but you put in money and then you lend it to people at 0% interest. Really? And you have to do it in $25 increments. Okay. But I mean, if you want to spend very little but actually directly help somebody, it's quite a great platform. Ooh, I wanna, I'm going to, as soon as we are done today, I'm going to look into that. Is it K-I-V-A? K-I-V-A dot org. I'm, I'm on a team called uh, Atheists and Agnostics, and, and it's not a competition, but my goal is to beat out all the Western religious organizations that are on there. <laughs> Can you invite me? Yeah, I'll invite you, or I'll link you to it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I want to. I want to. I want to join your team. But I think it's just a good activity to to sort of see impact without being. You can donate to the organization because they're doing great work. But the money you're putting up is is just a loan, so it's not actually charity. But it but it does help by giving low interest loans to people. Oh man. So yeah, it's a slippery slope because then you'll do more and more. <laughs> I am fully on board. That is a great idea. I am so angry at the interest rates that the Western world has. It is. It's obscene. It is obscene. And go listen to our episode on MMT. 
if you want to go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> okay. Modern monetary theory. Yeah. Okay. So you've given us a great resource with Beyond Investing. And I went to look at the website as we've been talking because I'm looking for this vegan index. So that's a great resource. Before this, I was doing some research into ESG funds, which I think go back to your buzzword situation where ESG funds are the lazy person's way to ethically invest. We have Chris Lose here who really is putting his money where his mouth is. And then you have people like Ethan who are not that dedicated and look more into ESG funds. Back to NerdWallet, my, my friendly place, explaining what ESG funds are. This is an article I found by Alana Benson. ESG funds are mutual funds graded using ESG, environmental, social, and governance principles. ESG funds invest in companies that aim to have a sustainable and societal impact in the world, such as those with a small carbon footprint or diverse leadership board. So if you are thinking about ethically investing, you can definitely go the Chris Lowe's way, or you could go the non-ethical way and just put it in the S&P 500, or you can go the halfway, perhaps Ethan way, and just look for ESG funds, which are more than doing zero. Yeah. Every step is every step forward is something. Uh, if you can't go straight for an electric car, go for a hybrid. You know, do the best you can. Everybody, I would rather have seven billion people doing something than than one person trying to do everything. And that article, which I'll link to in the show notes, it goes on to explain how putting in ESG funds is influencing large companies to sort of make a, a choice to be ethical and to make those decisions. But they also make a great case for why monetarily they're a good sort of like chris was explaining with the new technology vegan technology is new technology and therefore it's it's what will be in the future it's what we're going to make our money on they explain that a little bit more too while yes it is about being ethical you can make money this way too the ones that i'm most excited about are the the cultured meat investments i, I feel like that is i feel like we're on the ground floor right now and if anybody who hasn't heard about it yet basically we're taking stem cells bone marrow from uh, a few animals, putting it into a laboratory setting, giving it the nutrients it needs to grow. And basically we're growing a steak without having to feed an animal for 12 years, without having to slaughter them, without having to transport them. Invi it's far more environmentally friendly. It's far more efficient. It's far more nutritional. It, it's going to change the world as soon as some people get over the idea that it's grown in a lab, because I mean, let's face it, that's exactly where everybody's meat comes from nowadays. Anyway, it's going through a factory to get to you. It's going to be frozen or it's going to be processed, especially when it comes to deli meat. If anybody's afraid of factory of their food going through a factory, deli meat is made in a factory. Uh, it's very exciting. And I think it's going to it's going to change the world for many generations. And Chris, you're definitely not crazy. If you just look at the stats and the data, we're, we're on our way to eating lab-grown meat eventually. Um, okay, heading to wrap up here a little bit. If right after we end this episode, I want to go start investing ethically, how would I do that? So I believe that everyone should at least make some sort of financial commitment to invest in companies that are doing good things for our planet and humanity through sustainable impact investments. I would really appreciate if everybody realized that their government is not going to help them. We have the power to make that change. Uh, I would Google beyond uh, investing. I will give you uh, JC's LinkedIn so she can uh, reach out to her. All of my stuff is run through JC at Morgan Stanley. And she's in the United States. Outside of the United States, I have a few other people. If anybody listening is in Canada, I can give you a hookup. You'll, you'll, you'll probably link my info in the show notes as well. I'll, I'll put your info and I'll put, if you give me any links to Canada, et cetera, I'll put them there. But if, if, there, if you don't see those links, reach out to Chris on your own. <laughs> if anybody wants to talk about veganism too, I'll talk about that in far more detail than I have on the, on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I realize we talk about that a lot, but it, it plays into it and to why you're ethically investing. Just questioning again. So you've been six years, you've been with JC doing the ethical investing? I think we did, I think we did, discovered her maybe three years ago. But all has gone well. You have, I assume, not lost money in the market and you're very happy with your investments. I don't know how transparent we need to be here, but we've done quite well. We've seen some, some huge spikes 
a few times we saw a couple dips that scared us. And then uh, we just saw things turn right around. Yeah, this is great. This is like the beyond investing. I just I always thought if you were going to ethically invest, you just had to choose from funds or do it on your own. And I didn't realize there were brokers who actually specialize in making sure things are ethically invested. So that's, again, going the lazy way of I want to do it. What resources can I use other people to help me be ethical without me having to focus on it? You need a professional, just like so many other things. You and I were not, we weren't trained in this. We're, we don't have time to dedicate it to full time. You need somebody and you need to pay somebody good to do that for you. I would be lost without JC. Speaking of which, sorry, I just talked to her yesterday about cryptocurrency. And even she recommends at least 3% of your portfolio should be in crypto at the moment. We're, first of all, we're going to do an episode on cryptocurrency. This year, it has been attacked and villainized for being not sustainable and not, not environmentally friendly. But your vegan ethical investor told you to put 3% into cryptocurrency. She did bring up how energy intensive it is. It is. That is an undeniable thing. That I've, the people who are mining their electricity bills are going through the roof. But it's in its infancy. Just like cars were very unsustainable when they first came out, cars, even cars, were getting more and more sustainable. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. And, and I have a book recommendation for anyone called The Grid, which explains how the electrical grid works in the United States. They don't talk about cryptocurrency at all. The book's like 10, 10 or so years old. But there's a way that cryptocurrency can be sustainable, no, no problem. Computers are useful. Just because they use electricity doesn't mean we need to get rid of them. It just means we need to make them sustainable, and, and we do have that in our power. We'll get to that on the crypto episode, but I'm so glad the ethical investors said 3% in cryptocurrency. Uh, some wrap-up questions. What financial advice would you give to anybody starting out in your career right now? Use your credit cards as an emergency, not as everyday currency. So I had a credit card for an emergency. Next thing you know, uh, going to breakfast was an emergency. Buying a new PlayStation was an emergency. Then I couldn't make my payments. Or somebody told me that, you know, you can just make the minimum payment. I'm like, oh, I can. I can. And nobody's going to yell at me. So then I just started making minimum payments. And next thing I know, I was up to my eyeballs in credit card debt. Respect credit cards. They're so enticing. It feels like free money. It's not. They're going to get, for every dollar they give you, they're going to get five if you're not careful. Respect the credit cards and realize that the 0.1% interest rate is only for 30 days. And then after that, it's 17, 18, 19, and they're going to get you. They're much smarter than we are. So just don't fall for it. I love that. Word of caution about credit cards. And if you're listening and you are paying the minimum, let me encourage you to pay a little bit over the minimum at least. Okay. Is there a book or a resource that has helped you with the financial or business side of your career? Oh man, this is going to sound so trite, but it was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad did it for me. My dad is a wonderful human being. He's very good with money. He still comes from the days when time and money are linked. Um, his way to do it was to work for the same company for 30 years, collect a pension, go on your one vacation a year. And I, I didn't know how to start a business. I didn't know how to start a trust. I didn't know how to uh, become uh, invest in real estate. I had to learn a lot of that on my own. Uh, my parents were very helpful, very supportive in that. But it just wasn't normal conversation at our family dinner table. It was work hard, make some money, go play with that money, and then go back to work. I had a really hard time. I still, I'm still working on breaking that cycle. I'm trying to find... Uh, as you'd mentioned, my seven streams, I'm currently at four streams, that money is value. And if you devalue yourself, you're going to devalue your money and you have to be in relationship with your money. And that's what I learned from that book, that if, if your life revolves around scarcity, you're going to perpetuate scarcity. If you focus on, and I don't want to sound too hippy dippy here, but 
if you focus on value, you're going to add value to your life. All right, that's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I'm just going to point out that this is episode 78. And we don't talk about books on every episode, but you're probably the 10th person that has said that book. So if you're listening and you haven't read that book, think about it. It takes like an hour. It's a short book. There's audio versions available. You can find it on YouTube for free. But you should listen. Yes, it doesn't have to do with art, but it does have to do with finance and mindset. And we had Miata Adoga on here, and, and she's an actress, and she has a money financial planning company for creatives. She doesn't talk about Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but she does talk what you said about relationship with your money, relationship with finance. You need to have a healthy relationship. Excellent recommendation. I suggest everyone listening go read that book. Uh, so the book that led me to that one was uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I, I, I did a whole self-help couple months where I was just going and reading all the ones, you know, all the very, the secret, all the ones that are, you know, top sellers, the ones that are the most popular and say what you will about self-help stuff. I wouldn't ever join the self-help circuit or anything like that, but there's some really good information in there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of people, a lot of charlatans in there just trying to jump on the bandwagon, but man, there's some really good stuff in there. All right. Uh, final question for you. Where can people connect with you? All right. So even though I don't live in Las Vegas, my website is still q3lv.com. That's, uh, that's the name of my company. Uh, I started off as an LLC and moved it to an S-Corp, which uh, I had to do for when I was told to do it. Uh, so www.q3lv.com. I'm also all over the social medias. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. It's Chris Lose, L-O-S-E. I keep my Facebook to people that I only really know. Instagram, I'm wide open. LinkedIn, I'm wide open. And I'm always available through my website. All right. Well, Chris, I had an absolute blast talking with you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I always appreciate it. That's it for this week's episode. My takeaways are there is a vegan index fund, ticker V-E-G-N. It pays a dividend and has a cost ratio of 0.6%, which is higher than the socially responsible fund average of 0.4%, but being good to the planet comes at a cost. Always take action, even if it's small or not enough. Even the tiniest improvement over time can 10x its impact. And finally, we focused on ethical investing in the confines of capitalism. The top holdings of the VEGN ETF include MasterCard, Google, and Microsoft. And while those companies promote social responsibility more than others, not everybody would consider them ethical companies. All that to say, this is a way of using our individualistic society to slowly move the status quo toward a better place. Yes, we are still complicit and entangled in the system that maintains inequality around the globe, those with wealth are able to gain more wealth. Those without stay without. And this is especially important to artists because this system is not beneficial to artists. If you have listened to our Artistic Finance 6K episode, the one from May 2021, you'll know I struggled when it came to investing in art. Rather than investing in masterworks or an NFT, we ended up putting that money into commissioning a painting from artist Brett Slater. Our return on capital will be zero, or negative 100%, but we'll feel better about the impact we're having on a fellow artist rather than commoditizing art. What do you think? Are you ethical with your investments? Can you be ethical with investments? Let me know by leaving a comment on LinkedIn or email me at artisticfinancepodcast at gmail.com. And an update on Chris. After our interview, he joined Kiva.org and made three microloans. And he joined my team, which is A+. Atheists, agnostics, skeptics, free thinkers, secular humanists, and the non-religious. We've lent $9 million less than the Kiva Christians, but I hope to see us outlend them at some point during my lifetime. And now we have Chris on our side. Now, Chris, I met on LinkedIn. So if you're an artist and you're wondering if you should be on LinkedIn, 
which is historically a business-focused platform, listen to our episode with lighting designer Dawn Chang. She makes a case for it, I take a stand against it, and, well, I guess you're listening to how that story ended. The LinkedIn episode was 73, and I'll link to it in the show notes. If you like this content and you want to keep it going, please remember to follow and subscribe wherever you listen to the show. Gaining downloads is the number one metric I have to gauge growth. Listening is great. Following or subscribing so that the episodes download every week is even better. And the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear, which is to say, telling someone about this show is the number one way that we have reached new listeners. The show is free, but you can pay a voluntary fee by telling somebody about it. Share an episode with a colleague and tell them what you liked about it. Or, if you're feeling naughty, pick your least favorite episode and share it with someone you don't like. That wouldn't be very nice or ethical during the holiday season, but it's an option. And if you're looking for an ethical investment of your own, one that returns 0% annually and also doesn't return the principal, you can become a patron of the show. Your return on investment is early access to episodes, a private podcast feed, and knowing that your pledge is keeping this show going. Join our 24 patrons at patreon.com slash artistic finance. And here's a LinkedIn trick I learned. When you become a patron of artistic finance, you're assigned a level. You are an associate producer, a co-producer, an investor, an executive producer, or a lead producer of artistic finance. Now on LinkedIn, I created a company page for artistic finance. This means in your experience section, you can add artistic finance and list yourself as whatever your title is. Maybe I'm just having too much fun on LinkedIn, but it's an option. And speaking of too much fun, we are working on replacing our theme music. So if you love what we have, there is still time to save it. Just let me know. So far, no one has contacted me about saving it, including the composer himself. But you could be the first. Now, if you are still listening, you are a super listener. And because you are a super listener, I'm going to leave you with this little thought. If you want to open yourself up to 13 minutes of pain, go vote for Broadway World's Regional Awards. It's 13 minutes of pain because in order to vote for one category, you have to vote for all categories. However, if you're into sadomasochism, which is possible because 20% of the world's population is, then you should vote specifically in the off-off Broadway lighting design category. I would never tell you who to vote for, but I personally will be voting for Seesaw. What was that? Seesaw. Now, I'm not quite sure the ethics of voting for musicals you haven't seen. However, let me assure you that the lighting for Seesaw was gorgeous. Some have said the most gorgeous lighting to ever grace a stage in New York City. Don't ask me for names on that quote, but some have said that. Scroll to the bottom of the show notes to find a link for voting. Well, thanks for sticking with me for so long. I had a lot to say today, and I thank you for letting me say it. And thank you especially to my patrons. You are figuratively the best people in the world. Seesaw, seesaw, seesaw. That's it for today. Until next time, break a leg. Thank you for listening to Artistic Finance. Make sure to subscribe. To access our show notes, transcripts, or resources, go to artisticfinance.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decision, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by Artistic Finance. Written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.